So welcome everyone. Uh, many people signed up today, so we are a large crowd. Um, my name is uh, Veerle Bergink. I'm a psychiatrist and researcher. And today I'm going to talk about mental health treatments during pregnancy and postpartum periods. Uh, that's a broad topic, uh, all psychiatric disorders, mental health treatment. So the coming 45 minutes, I'm going to really give, give you a crash course in the most prevalent, most prevalent mental health problems and treatments and the most severe ones. So hopefully after these 45 minutes, you have really uh, an idea about the benefits of those treatments and the risks and the magnitude of those risks. And uh, if not, there is a 15 minutes um, Q&A session uh, afterwards. So I, uh, I, I will, then will will answer your questions, which, which you can just uh, type in uh, either during this lecture or, or after this lecture. This weekend, uh, maybe you saw it, I was reading uh, the New York Times and this was on the front page, this was the headline. Uh, this 19 year old girl uh, was prescribed uh, 10 different psychiatric drugs for mental health problems she had. Uh, this was anxiety, depression, and she was prescribed antipsychotics, antidepressants, HDHD medication. Um, and the headline is also, she was far from alone. And uh, I can relate to this. I have two daughters, 17 and 19, and many of their friends have uh, mental health problems. And many of these friends are also treated with multiple uh, psychiatric drugs. So it's all over the news. Is it maybe the uh, pandemic to blame? And, and yes, we know that uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a rise in, in mental health uh, problems and also a, a use of uh, psychiatric drugs. It, it's a bit dependent uh, for, for each state, but overall in the US, there is a 20% increase uh, of psychotropic uh, drug use over the last uh, two years. Um, but th that's not new. This trend has been uh, ongoing for a while because these are, you know, numbers from the beginning of the of this uh, century. And you see, uh, there is uh, a rise in mental health medication overall. And for women, uh, more more women than men use mental health medication. And also after 2010, it's going up, up, up. And even during the pandemic. Uh, it, it goes further up. Um, most or one of the most prevalent used mental health medications is antidepressants. And these are the most recent data from the CDC. Uh, so if you look at, uh, at those green bars uh, and specifically for women, these are women in their uh, reproductive ages and then you see that its uh, antidepressants are widely used. It's highly prevalent. Many women in their reproductive ages uh, use these. And th this is until 2018. And as I said, since then, it's, it's on the rise. Um, and it, this is important for uh, specifically my field because we should assume that women, all women of reproductive age, get pregnant. And this includes also women with mental health uh, disorders, because most women in their life will get children at some point and will get pregnant. And as I showed you, many uh, have mental health uh, problems and use medication. And women with anxiety or depression in history or HDHD or most women with mental health disorders will uh, uh, get as many pregnancies as the general population. So only uh, women with severe mental health disorders, such as schizophrenia, their fertility ratio, as we call it, so how many uh, pregnancies you will have compared to the general population is lower. Um, so you should assume that women of reproductive age uh, will get pregnant. And uh, many are using psychotropic medication. And, and you should also think about this medication because when someone gets pregnant, 
most people come during the first trimester, during those first weeks, and for teratogenicity, so uh, the, the effect on, on congenital abnormalities, the first trimester, as you can see, is key for all organ systems. And for the brain, this holds true during the whole uh, pregnancy period, but, but all other organs, the first trimester is key. And when someone comes in, it's a first trimester or our patients uh, with severe mental health problems, sometimes even later during the second trimester, the embryo or fetus is already exposed. Um, it's, it's not only teratogenicity we should think about, but also direct medications effect that can lead to neonatal withdrawal. Uh, it's very similar as in adults, as is right when you abruptly stop this, many patients have withdrawal effects and same for benzodiazepines, for example. So almost all psychotropic medication have these effects and same holds true for the neonate. And I will talk during this lecture also a bit about the long-term effects and some new data uh, medication can have on child development. So uh, assume women of reproductive age will get pregnant. And at this stage, even if they're young, even if they're girls, think about which medication you are prescribing. I think it's important to avoid polypharmacy if we can and use for women in a reproductive ages medication that we know more about, older medication, uh, so that we don't have to change if, if someone wants to get pregnant or unexpectedly gets pregnant. And some medications are really teratogenic. For example, valproic acid is, should not be used in women in the reproductive ages and, and carbamazepine is teratogenic as well. And of course, in an ideal world, the pregnancy is planned and you can make these decisions before pregnancy. And in an ideal world, you have discussed birth control. And in an ideal world, patients are psychiatrically stable before attempting pregnancy. Uh, but in the real world, not all of our patients are stable and uh, uh, unplanned pregnancy is, is highly prevalent and uh, which will be a panicky situation for everyone, but especially if you have mental health problems. So then I think it's extra important that healthcare providers do not panic and do not immediately uh, change medication, um, uh, but, but stay calm and reassure women that uh, they will be fine, uh, whatever decision they make. And uh, for us as healthcare providers from that moment on, we have two patients, the mother and the baby. Um, but uh, I, I think it's very important to realize that treating the mother is at that point a very high priority. Um, because um, uh, the, the risk of untreated mental illness of, uh, of pregnant patients are, are numerous. Uh, so if a mom is or a woman is depressed or anxious or psychotic or agitated, this will lead to poor health behavior, um, which comes with a risk for, for her health. Um, but also a uh, high chance of self-medication via substances and all kinds of, uh, you know, behavior which has effect on the child, child as well. Uh, so there is a large body of evidence out there that untreated mental illness leads to preterm birth, to low birth weight, uh, and also, unfortunately, uh, various longitudinal outcomes, including uh, effects on cognition, intelligence, motor development. So just as medication is an exposure, it's also untreated mental illness an exposure. And in general, we want to limit the total numbers of exposures during pregnancy. Um, uh, it's important, I think, that we all think about non-medicine treatment options. And during this lecture, I, I won't discuss these. And that's not because I don't think they are important, because they are very important, but just because everything that works outside pregnancy in the postpartum period also works during this period, including 
um, uh, self-care strategies such as um, uh, exercise or, or yoga or mindfulness, but all psychotherapies also. Um, and, and also important treatment considerations is that ECT or other treatments all work during this period uh, as well. So mood and anxiety disorders are highly prevalent. I, I started the lecture uh, uh, you know, showing at least the numbers of psychotropic use. And, uh, and in the news, their headlines, it's, it's very prevalent. One out of four um, mothers has these problems or uh, postpartum depression is also one out of four. And um, the, the prevalence, I think, is, is important. Uh, but it, we should also realize that it's dependent on uh, in which population you measure this and how you measure this, which, which questionnaires. And what I think is also interesting to see is what are what is the prevalence of mood and anxiety disorders over this period of time. So is the risk, for example, higher specifically in the postpartum period, what has all, all, always been uh, assumed? So uh, we did a, a study in uh, the, the Danish population looking at the prevalence and incidence of depression uh, both before pregnancy, this is the, le the left part, during pregnancy and after pregnancy. And you see that for the red bars, this is um, the, the prevalence, it's very prevalent during all these times. Uh, these are outpatient uh, psychiatric treatments. Well, there is a bit of a peak right after delivery. Um, in terms of, of diagnosis and screening, uh, it's important that uh, everyone during pregnancy or postpartum is, and that's also the recommendation um, of uh, uh, obstetric societies, is screened for with the Edinburgh a postnatal depression scale. And uh, th th this is the scale. There, there are 10 um, easy to fill in questions. It only takes five minutes. And uh, why use this scale? It's basically because everyone is using it. So it's very well validated uh, during pregnancy, during the postpartum period, translated in many uh, languages, and it's easy to use. And there are no uh, items in there which are sensitive uh, for pregnancy or postpartum, uh, such as, um, for example, weight loss or libido loss, which is changed anyway during this period. Um, so if you want to use it, the easiest thing to do is type in Google EPDS online calculator and uh, it takes five minutes to fill in. You get a score between zero and 30. And the cutoff score is uh, is 12. And um, um, so you can do this yourself uh, to test it. And it's important to, to monitor the symptoms and uh, to pick it up. And if it's, it's higher than 12, then you should think about the depression. Um, so if, if someone has depression and anxiety, how to treat it? What do the guidelines say? We did a review a few years ago of all guidelines in the world, and these are the recommendations. So for new episodes, it's quite straightforward. If it's not so severe, then psychotherapy. There's most evidence for cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, but if the depression is severe, the guidelines, all guidelines in the world clearly say that you should start an antidepressant. And you should go with the antidepressant that worked before, uh, if someone has tried things before. Uh, and if not, if there is a new start, then there's a preference for sertraline. Um, the guidelines are not so clear for women who are using antidepressants. And I showed you that is you know, a huge part of the population. The antidepressants are currently one of the most used treatments during uh, pregnancy, medication treatments. So the guidelines do not say whether someone should continue or discontinue this medication because there, there is not enough evidence to say so. So in this lecture, I will uh, quantify a, a bit the risks and benefits of both. But the guidelines do say that if uh, the neonate should be observed because of a neonatal adaptation. So when the child is born, uh, the child is not exposed to SSRIs anymore. So there will be some 
irritability, sometimes jitterness, um, uh, some breathing issues, which are all very mild usually and transient. And there is a very small risk of a, a more serious complication, pulmonary hypertension. And breastfeeding is encouraged. Um, all SSRIs, the, the levels are really low in breast milk and lowest for sertraline. So the benefits of antidepressants, antidepressants have of course been wi uh, widely investigated and it's important to realize that the number needed to treat is seven. So there is one in seven chance of a benefit beyond placebo or um, uh, the natural disease course getting better. And is this worth the risk associated with taking the drug? So the risk uh, for the child. Um, specifically during pregnancy. And, and of course, one out of seven is just a number because there is many patients for which it is very clear that antidepressants work and that patients need this. And remember, like I said before, treating a maternal illness is the highest priority. Um, so uh, especially patients who have unsuccessfully tried to taper previously, or uh, patients who uh, have like chronic symptoms and, and really uh, need this medication uh, to maintain stable. And, and also many patients with anxiety disorder, for example, panic disorder responds really well to SSRIs, uh, will, uh, will clearly benefit for, for, from this medication. But there are also uh, uh, many patients out there for which it's less clear given uh, that, uh, you know, they, they got this in a stressful period long time ago and never tried to taper. So what about the risks? We know that antidepressant use is associated with low birth weight and preterm birth, but that holds also true for the underlying maternal illness, depression and anxiety. And antidepressant use is associated with, as I said, poor neonatal adaptation, uh, which is uh, not associated with the underlying maternal illness. But, but this is usually mild. It's jitterness, restlessness, increased muscle tone. Um, a much more serious complication is persistent pulmonary hypertension of the neonate. And what we've been trying to do in our recent research is trying to, to quantify these risks. And um, if we're doing the studies, and that was true for, for all recent studies, the very important is to, to correct for the confounding by indication. So really look at the maternal underlying illness and what that is doing. And also in child outcomes, remember that you know, for children, uh, they are at risk if the, if the mo mother has psychiatric illness, uh, a genetic risk, but also environmental risk. So uh, this is just an example of a, a, a recent study we've been doing, again, in the entire Danish population, um, ending up with 21,000 um, women who continued antidepressants during pregnancy, compared to 23,000 women who discontinued antidepressants during pregnancy. Uh, so they, this means that the control group are women who also are um, uh, you know, had a mental health problems, mood problems severe enough to be treated. And you can argue the case that the women who continue medication are not the same to women who, who discontinue because they have a reason to continue. They, they tried to tape and it didn't work. So uh, therefore we, we adjust for, for other factors, but you can never make it go away entirely. Um, so, so these are the results. Uh, in, in these recent studies, we found that antidepressant exposure during any point in pregnancy was associated with a modest decrease in gestational age, uh, two days. So you could say, well, that's not so relevant. I mean, why do I, do I care if my patient, you know, delivers uh, at 39 weeks and five days or 39 weeks and three days? Um, and a 50 grams lower birth weight is, is not so much either. Uh, but, but that's not the problem. I think the, the main issue is that some women will deliver really preterm before 37 weeks. And we know that is associated uh, with um, all kinds of adverse outcomes later in life. 
So in our study, and this is been found by others as well. The magnitude of the risk is 1.4. The odds ratio is 1.4, meaning that there is a 40% chance increase of being preterm. Um, and the really you know, more severe complication, pulmonary hypertension, we found that this is only when the exposure is during the second half of pregnancy. So if women taper during the first half of pregnancy, the risk is not increased. And if they continue during pregnancy, the number needed to harm is somewhere between 400 and 5,000, which means that you have to treat 400 or 5,000 uh, patients to have one additional uh, case of pulmonary uh, hypertension, which can be severe. It's a severe outcome with morbidity and mortality. For long-term outcomes, it's all good news. There are now many studies out there. Some are ours, some are other huge databases, and they are more and more carefully controlled for the underlying maternal illness. And then, yes, um, if, if the mother has a mental illness and she uses medication, there, there is a, an increased risk on adverse outcomes in the children as well might be a genetic risk or environmental risk, but SSRI exposure does not add to this risk. So meaning there is no increased risk in all these studies, uh, which is likely due to antidepressant, which I think is really good news uh, for mothers who use it or have been using it because many children have mental health problems these days. And I think parents and, and, and also mothers always think, okay, what should I have done different? Should I have not used those antidepressant medications? So this is all uh, reassuring information. And uh, you know, hopefully both these long and short-term risk enables you to, to weight all, the, all of these things. And so what about postpartum depression? Um, these are some studies done in uh, SSRIs for postpartum depression and they work. And uh, there is no reason to think that SSRIs work any different during the postpartum period than they work at other times, but less trials have been done. So I think in our thinking, we should still think about the number needed to treat of seven we have as in, you know, at other times. Um, but. SRIs in general have, of course, been very well investigated, and we know that they work. So in, in my experience, now I'm doing mostly research, but for many, many years, I've seen many, many patients, both under and over treatment is a problem in the postpartum period. And I will explain, because I've seen patients who uh, immediately after delivery, even in the first or second week, were prescribed uh, SSRIs. Uh, while well, they were in the midst of their baby blues, so the, the mood changes after delivery, uh, the GP started something, uh, or, or maybe there were, you know, other live events. Of course, getting a child is a major live event, but also the child was at the ICU, or, you know, it was a, a very tumultuous period. And then when uh, uh, the mother gets better, you never know in the end, you know, was it the SSRI effect or was it the natural course? But the other way around, we see this a lot as well, of course. And women who have for months, for years, uh, severe uh, mood problems, depression, anxiety, which is untreated um, and, and which is really uh, you know, not good for herself, but also for the whole family. And unfortunately, we know that especially women uh, of lower socioeconomic status are often undertreated. And uh, also women of color um, uh, are, are undertreated. It's not picked up uh, during this, uh, this period. Um, there's a new kid on the block for uh, postpartum depression treatment. It's actually the only treatment FDA approved um, is for postpartum uh, depression is Braxanolone infusion. And it was approved with the argument that there is no current treatment for postpartum depression. Well, I told you that it's not true. As rice work and many non-medicine options work very well as well. Uh, but anyway, um, so this allows for fewer clinical trials before approval. And um, uh, there were actually two studies 
uh, published in the Lancet, which were very key for approval of these drugs. And uh, here I'm showing you the remission da data, mainly because remission, I think, is very important, um, even more than, you know, decrease in symptoms. Um, and uh, one of the remarkable things about rexanolon, it's an uh, GABA uh, A agonist, is that it works fast. Uh, and that's what you see here in the slide. But you see that after, at least in the first study, after uh, day seven, day 30, it was not significant compared to placebo. And in the second study, uh, after day 30, uh, which means, uh, at least for me, that the remission benefits uh, are, are not so clear of this uh, new drug. Well, at the same time, uh, patient admission is needed and that the drug is very expensive and uh, patients have significant sedation. Uh, so the effect size are moderate during the infusion itself, um, but uh, smaller the days after. So I think for, uh, for us as clinicians, it's very important to see if rexanolone is um, doing better than the medication we have, or at least being non-inferior. And uh, it's, it's very exciting that there are other gay biologic drugs being tested, such as Zuralon, which is an oral compound and uh, which could be uh, very promising if it works fast, but it's in the phase of phase three trials and things are being published now. So I think it's uh, important to follow this. Um, I will also talk a bit about bipolar disorder and postpartum psychosis. Bipolar disorder because it's 2% uh, of the population and many of these women uh, get pregnant, the fertility ratio is 0.8. Uh, and also because there is something with bipolar disorder and pregnancy in a postpartum period making this disorder a specifically high risk uh, for, for this period. And postpartum psychosis is one of the most severe uh, emergencies we have in psychiatry and clearly associated with bipolar disorder. I'll start with uh, the prevalence incidents again. Uh, so these are psychiatric admissions, severe psychiatric episodes. And here you see that the pattern is very different during pregnancy and after delivery than it is for non-severe episodes, which is that right after delivery, there is somehow an enormous increase in risk in really severe episodes, because you have to be quite sick to be admitted to a psych ward. Uh, so in this holds true both for incident as well as recurrent cases. So women who have had nothing, all of a sudden can get super ill right after delivery. You know, I worked for the, for the last 15 years figuring out what the trigger is. And we've done tons of work, but there is still Nobel prizes to win here because, but something is happening there. <coughs> and those episodes are called postpartum psychosis, which is a bit confusing for two reasons, because it's called psychosis, but it's not a psychotic disorder. It's actually a mood disorder, a bipolar spectrum disorder. And the second difficult thing is that it's not into our current classification system. Um, so uh, we are working with a group to get it in because it is important that it's acknowledged that it's a distinct disorder in the bipolar spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think we will get it in. We're, we're getting there. Uh, Ten professors worldwide are working on it. Um, and it's important for multiple reasons. Uh, so uh, women with postpartum psychosis are sometimes so sick that they, you know, even uh, are at high risk of um, killing their child. And here in the US, they just say, uh, well, a postpartum psychosis is a disorder that does not exist. So women can spend their life in jail, unfortunately. Um, so it's important to get this acknowledged, to be able to prevent the disorder and treat it well. And it's also good to realize that even though it's related to bipolar disorder, it's not the same. So most patients with postpartum psychosis are manic or have a mixed episode, uh, but um, they might have a single episode. Some women have postpartum psychosis and go on to have episodes during their lives um, and this was the first start of bipolar disorder, but other women only have these episodes right after delivery and are only at risk 
right after delivery. So the treatment of postpartum psychosis, uh, there is very scarce literature. Uh, there are two case series that are larger. One interesting study from India really reported a successful ECT treatment. So that's an excellent treatment choice. And our own study on uh, the sequential treatment with benzodiazepine, antipsychotics, and lithium, which were really well, 98% achieved complete remission while these women are very, very sick. Um, in clinical practice, lithium is not that often used. Most clinicians treat with antipsychotics. Um, I would really argue the case to treat with lithium because not everyone gets into remission without lithium. That's one. And it's also, uh, and we have data showing this, uh, prevent the relapse uh, during the first year uh, postpartum, which is important for the disease course. So the recurrent psychiatric admissions, um, the risk is very high as well. So who are these women? Women at highest risk of severe episode postpartum are women with a history of postpartum psychosis and women with bipolar disorder. And I explained a bit that these things are related, but not the same. And the risk was always said to be like somewhere between 20 to 80%. So we tried to quantify this risk. And we looked at all studies in bipolar disorder and women with a history of postpartum psychosis. So this is 0% relapse risk, 50%, 100%. This, this data show that it's highly variable, but also this is chronological, that there is not any improvement over time. So over the last decades, there is no improvement in getting these risks down, which I think is very tragic because the risk is one out of three on average, which is very high. Um, and we have nine months to prevent these episodes. And therefore an important take home message of this lecture is prevent these episodes and start prophylaxis immediately postpartum, the day of the delivery, start lithium, for example, most evidence for lithium or antipsychotics, the day of delivery in all women with bipolar disorder and postpartum psychosis. Of course, women should agree with it. You should explain it. Some women do not want it. That's a different story, but it should be offered uh, to everyone because too often we still uh, see women who are getting very sick while there is no need. So uh, in women with a history of postpartum psychosis, um, there are, are studies uh, a few studies, not, not many, including ours, that um, uh, it's sufficient to start uh, prophylaxis right after delivery so that the child is not exposed. For women with bipolar disorder, it's unfortunately a bit more complicated. And uh, I will show you why. Uh, so this is a study we did in uh, 909 bipolar women. And here you see that uh, indeed the risk of, you know, getting an episode after birth was uh, a bit more than 30%, which is very similar than many other studies, or at least the outcomes of the meta-analysis. But also after miscarriage and after abortion, there is a high risk of uh, a mood episode, which signals again that something is happening from the transition from pregnancy to postpartum period in women with bipolar disorder, putting them at risk. And these, in our study, data on uh, episodes during pregnancy is reassuring. It's really low. So you could think, OK, fine. You know, the risk is not so high during pregnancy. Women do not need medication uh, during pregnancy. Well, unfortunately, that is not true. Because if you look at our meta-analysis and you look at medication used during pregnancy, the women who used and the this data are mainly on lithium, then the risk is low. Whereas in medication, women without medication, the risk for relapse is higher than 50%. And we found the same in our cohort study. And at that time in the Netherlands, most uh, uh, people were using lithium. And we find that the risk uh, for a severe relapse after delivery, if women are not using lithium during pregnancy, was twice as high. So um, then medication use during pregnancy. So yes, but unfortunately that is also a bit complicated. 
because there are new, two relatively recent studies out there showing that lithium is related to congenital malformations with an odds ratio of 1.7, mean 70% additional risk. And these are the absolute numbers. This is from um, a study we did with uh, in multiple countries. And also a very good study from US Medicaid patients showed that there is a dose response relation. So it's only during the first trimester, it's only at higher doses, uh, and the risk is lower than previously thought. But still, there is an association between lithium during pregnancy and congenital malformation. So I think alter alternative medications should also be uh, considered. Uh, if you treat with lithium, please note that lithium levels drop during pregnancy uh, and go up again uh, to around delivery. There is no need to stop around delivery. Uh, the uh, postpartum period is very riskful, so I would not stop, uh, but you should monitor blood levels carefully. And ideally also for lamotrigine, which is an upcoming alternative mood stabilizer because it's not teratogenic. Whereas, as I said, valproic acid is very teratogenic, carbamazepine is car car uh, teratogenic, uh, lamotrigine is not. Um, the only thing is it, it's mo mostly effective for mainly depressive episodes, not so much mania. Uh, but there you, we see uh, an, an increase in its use, but levels should be checked as well because they decrease during pregnancy. So if you raise the dose, then you should lower the dose uh, postpartum. Antipsychotics, there's a, a steep rise in antipsychotics use as well. Um, we know that there is a reduced um, uh, relation with preterm birth. Um, there are studies out there more and more, but not as many and not as good studies as with antidepressants. So uh, it, it's still unclear which part is the underlying maternal illness, which is, can be very severe for women who are using antipsychotics because they have psychotic disorder or uh, bipolar disorder, um, and, and what is the, the magnitude of the medication effect. We know there is an increase in especially second generation antipsychotics, and which clearly comes with, a, uh, with gestational diabetes risk, and also the, the risk for uh, gestational diabetes, what this means on the longer term are unknown, which is the reason that we're write, writing grants to both cohort and and um, uh, and register-based studies to investigate this. Um, uh, if you use more medication, there is more risk. So polypharmacy is try to avoid it. And um, also long-term data are, are a bit unclear. We did a recent study, which was really reassuring uh, that there was not an increased risk in important mental health outcomes. But again, more research is needed. Um, there is also an increase of the women using this or people using it as sleep medication as, you know, uh, antipsychotics are, are more broadly used. And I'm not sure if that is a good idea uh, during pregnancy uh, specifically. So use monotherapy. Uh, Ketiapine is top choice due to lowest rate of placental passage. If things are equal, but in in, in clinical practice, uh, you, you'll go with the medication uh, the patient is already using and what works well. And it's important to do this together uh, as a team with mental health care providers and an obstetrician uh, or, or other uh, doctors to, to, to look at the, all aspects of health and avoid newer drugs. So uh, not so much during pregnancy. It's not so useful changing during pregnancy, but think about this when you start prescribing this um, before a conception or in anyone in their reproductive ages. So lithium and clozapine breastfeeding is not recommended. Um, uh, at least that's what I recommend. I know some people uh, do it. There are case series out there. Um, in, in general, for many psychotropic drugs, the, uh, the relevant infant dose is low, and so it's very safe, uh, for example, as a rise. Um, but I think for women with severe mental illness, breast is not always best. 
because it uh, it's associated with sleep loss. And as I showed you, there are the risk in the postpartum period for uh, se really severe episodes is really high. But that's, of course, a point very open uh, for discussion. HDHD, um, as for all other psychotropic drugs, there is also a really increase in uh, women in reproductive ages using HDHD medication. And again, the research is behind. So we urgently need these studies as well because women come in and they want to know what to do. And some women can easily stop. But we also know that some women might actually lose their job or get themselves into trouble if they are not taking uh, this medication. Um, the, the, what is out there is relatively reassuring. There might some, you know, again, relation with preterm birth, then we have to, to um, uh, investigate the underlying maternal illness. Um, so basically, reviews say that there is not enough data out there. Uh, there is a, also a relation with um, uh, preeclampsia or hypertension. Uh, we did a new study on long-term outcomes, but it's not... Uh, published yet, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but it's reassuring as well. Um, and um, yeah, again, uh, because uh, so many women are using it these days and, and also during pregnancy, uh, we should uh, follow up and collect this data. So uh, three simple take home messages for this lecture. Assume women of reproductive age will get pregnant. So please think about polypharmacy and which medication uh, uh, at any time during reproductive age in all patients. Do not undertreat because uh, treatment of mental illness is especially important during pregnancy and postpartum. But try to avoid polypharmacy and search for the lowest dose. And last, star prophylaxis postpartum is really important uh, in women at high risk, which is women with postpartum psychosis in history or women with bipolar disorder. And this will literally uh, prevent severe episodes and thus lives. And I think a last take home message is that it's also important, even, you know, if you feel that you're up to date, there, there's always, you know, new studies out there. Uh, so take some time if you see a patient to, to actually look it up. So there is a LACMED database, which really gives uh, information on each particular drugs. Uh, and same in PubMed, of course, you can search for studies. And there's some websites outside out there also giving some, some general information. So um, yeah, I, uh, I, I will stop here and uh, happy to, um, uh, to, to take uh, questions. Um, Uh, as prolactin is a dopamine antagonist, would not breastfeeding be a negative factor in uh, postpartum depression? Um, as far as I know, there is no difference in moms who breastfeed or not breastfeed in terms of um, uh, bonding of the child. That's the studies uh, we have uh, been doing. So I would not say that it's a negative factor in women with postpartum depression. Of course, it's uh, if women can breastfeed, if they're depressed, that is amazing. And uh, But if not, because um, it, it, it's not going so well, I, I, I don't think there is enough evidence out there to say that it's a negative factor. Um, is the risk for postpartum bipolar disorder after delivery dependent on mode of delivery? Um, the, 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 the short answer uh, is no, um, because women with bipolar disorder are not randomized to having, you know, a C-section or not. So um, the, the women with bipolar disorder who, who might have end up having a C-section, either they're 
physician decided to do so uh, because the woman was unwell or very anxious. Um, so those groups are not cannot be easily be compared. Um, but um, it, it, it is not clearly a risk factor, nor being protective uh, for, for a postpartum episode. Um, uh, can you speak to risk for postpartum, postpartum psychosis for patients with a history of a brief episode of psychosis prior to pregnancy, but no other mental health diagnosis? So no history of bipolar. What do you consider the window of risk for postpartum psychosis to onset? Is there an immediate protracted risk? And so the question is, if someone has like has had a short episode of psychosis before, uh, what should you do right after delivery to make sure that she does not get uh, psychosis? So given that she had psychosis, she is at increased risk. Uh, the median onset is at day eight. So it's really the first two weeks in which she is at higher risk. And then it's dependent on, I think, the severity of this first episode. If you would start prophylactic medication right after delivery, uh, if you do so, I would do it for the first three months. That's what we currently do in clinical practice, even though it's not um, uh, widely investigated. Um, so uh, she might want to start something to prevent it, given that she's uh, at high risk, um, and, um, and do this from zero to three months. Um, is there data for use of Welbutrin in pregnancy and postpartum? Yes, there is, but I think for every individual medication, you should really look for updated uh, data, but it's, um, uh, 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 yes, there, there is safety data out there. And yes, we see many women who choose to continue it uh, during pregnancy. Um, are you taking, uh, under consideration the hormonal level change, mainly uh, progesterone induced mental health stability when we choose for which medication we use. No, we never do this. So we never measure hormones, even though in our thinking, we know, okay, these hormones have a major impact on our mental health uh, for, for women in general, estrogen, progesterone, uh, all sex steroids. And we know that likely also the drop in sex steroids after delivery plays a role, but it does not have any clinical consequence in measuring hormones and relate it to the decision how we treat and which treatments. Um, what is my opinion on non-invasive brain stimulation as a treatment of depression for pregnant women, in particularly RTMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation for male to moderate and ECT for more severe depression? Uh, yeah, I think it's an excellent idea because I'm very enthusiastic about non-medicine options. In an ideal world, I would combine, you know, treating these women with either a case series or in an ideal world, even other design study to, to also get the evidence out there. So we do not have any reason to believe that it, the efficacy of TMS is different during the perinatal period as it is in other periods. But again, I think uh, the more data out there, the better. So I'm very happy uh, to participate in TMS uh, studies in this particular group uh, because, yeah, I think that's the way to go. Search for more and novel non-medicine options as well. And, and in addition to, to medication during pregnancy for those women who need it. Um, uh, is there a good time to take the antidepressant relevant to when the women uh, breastfeeds? No, we, we, uh, the, the levels of antidepressants are really low. I think it's most important that women are compliant and take it at the same time they're used to. Um, have you seen any links between pito pitocin and increased chances of developing postpartum depression? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, that I can ask my colleague uh, Talia Robakis. Um, um, increased risk of postpartum psychosis 
uh, there's an increased risk of postpartum psychosis if women have bipolar disorder, but does it matter if you have a severe bipolar disorder or mild bipolar diagnosis? So the short answer is yes. So if you have bipolar one disorder, then you are at highest risk of postpartum psychosis. If you have bipolar two disorder, uh, then, and I would almost say per definition, your vulnerability for psychosis and mania is a, is a bit less because otherwise you would have bipolar one disorder. So the risk of someone with bipolar two disorder getting psychotic or mania after delivery is lower than if you have bipolar one disorder. However, still overall, the relapse risk is very high. So then it would be more shift to depressive episode for all women with bipolar disorder. So also for women with bipolar two disorders, I would consider um, prophylaxis right after delivery. Um, um, have you conducted any studies that test effect effectiveness, effectiveness of combining use of an app by moms in addition to SSRI, that would be amazing. And I would love to do such a study and I have not done it. Um, are there any other measures for postpartum anxiety? The MRO seems to struggle in capturing uh, anxiety. Um, there, there are a few items in the MRO to measure anxiety. There, there are other uh, skills uh, uh, as well. Uh, we have developed an anxiety Skill, the Tilburg distress skill, which is more measuring anxiety, but there are others out there as well. Um, do you know if there's a sex difference in terms of sex of the baby and risk for postpartum episodes? No, there is not. Uh, is ketamine ever used for postpartum depression treatment? Not that I know of. Uh, well, ca cases, uh, may maybe. Um, will the slides, yes, the slides will be uh, available. Um, are there more specific recommendations uh, for uh, patients going to IVF treatment? Um, yeah, so there is a relation between IVF uh, treatment and um, an increased risk for uh, mental health problems during pregnancy and postpartum. I think one of the reasons might be uh, that you know your expectations might be because you so wanted this baby and this pregnancy may be high and it's just such a hard period. So that's my, it's not research wise, but that's my personal experience. So that might help in treatment or counseling patients, you know, uh, to discuss these expectations to be those being more realistic. Um, Um, can you describe typical psychotic uh, symptoms you have seen in postpartum patients? Um, yeah, so um, many delusions, sometimes related to the child, hallucinations, also weird enough visual hallucinations are relatively prevalent, uh, paranoids, for example, not trusting their partner, um, not trusting everyone, and, and thus not telling what, what women really think. And psychotic symptoms are fluctuating, which makes it difficult to diagnose. And they often go together with mood symptoms such as depression or, or mania. Um, the question on how high to go with lamotrigine uh, during pregnancy, and uh, that one I will ask my uh, colleague uh, because I cannot immediately answer it. Um, I think I've answered this one as well. Um, can you discuss the use of long acting? antipsychotics among pregnant women. So there is not specific research focused on this group. So in, in my years of practice, I was not using a long acting uh, uh, antipsychotics uh, uh, during pregnancy. Um, I uh, think I 
uh, answered um, most questions. There are some in the chat, maybe. Um, and I think I uh, answered uh, these as well. Um, so if there are um, uh, not more questions, I thank you all for your attendance.